I had never been on the deep web. Thought the whole thing sounded stupid. Some elicted part of the internet with unknown atrocities living in every corner. But I was working on my master thesis in sociology and I thought a paper on the internet subculture sounded interesting. I got together with a friend and he talked to me about Tor and showed me the different precautions I could take to protect my identity and my computer while browsing the deep web. I was ready to explore the bizarre hive I had heard so much about. Needless to say, for about two weeks, I stiffed through old websites that looked like they'd been developed during the 90s. Obscure internet relics floating out in the middle of nowhere. Derelict websites forgotten by time. Most of it was boring junk. Lots of Nazi conspiracy theories, drug traffickers, pedophiles. It was what I expected. I would have never been content to do my paper on Nazi subcultures on the deep web. Or maybe even pedophiles. But I ran across something that really interested me. It was a form awkwardly titled Enthusiast of Suicide. The name led me to believe this form wasn't of English speaking origin. The form itself had a multi-irrational array of boards for users from different countries. I saw boards in Spanish, French, Turkish, and Chinese. A vast array of boards. But there was never a common theme. Everyone on the boards was frantically obsessed with suicide. People in the English speaking boards would share different ideas about suicide. How to execute it. How to lessen the pain for people who were afraid of suffering. Stories about friends who had committed suicide. Suicide fetishes sharing explicit pictures with one another. People having philosophical discussions about suicide. It didn't seem to stop. Then one of the boards, I noticed some of the people asking about something called The Suicide Show. It's on tonight. Are you going to watch it? One would say. No, I can't. I have a big day tomorrow. I plan on going to work with my 38 and killing my boss. Then I'm going to kill myself. The other would respond, I cringed at reading this. The suicide show? If it was what it sounded like, then I was to be in some kind of webcast with a bunch of people committing suicide? I felt my stomach turn and my palms were sweaty, but my mind was racing with curiosity. I had to find out what the show was all about. This suicide cult had been giving me enough material for an exciting thesis, but this would be the cup de grace. I found out the show came on in my area, and I finished around until I found the link to the show. My throat had a huge knot sitting in it, and I know I must have been sweaty. But I couldn't let my nerves get in the way of my research. I was doing important work here. The live feed came on with an eerie sounding MDI player in the background. The film quality was grinning, as if I filmed using a cell phone or a cheap camera. A woman with a microphone held tightly in both hands stood a forced smile on her face. I could see her mascara and run down her face as she was crying. She looked as she may be doing to the 40s. She was Asian and looked incredibly uncomfortable and afraid. I gripped the armrest of my chair, my nails digging into it. She made me uneasy. The whole thing made me uneasy. But this was getting much more strange. She started speaking in a foreign language. So I quickly clicked the button that would display the English subtitles on screen. Welcome to the Suicide Show. I'll be your host this evening, she said, her pitch shaky and unnerved. Just the sound of her frightening voice made this so much surreal and slightly nauseating. Let's start the show, she shouted with an uneasy forced glee. She threw an arm up in the air, her teeth clenched lightly into a nervous smile and a tear rolling down from one eye. 
this had to be fake. It was weird, but there was no way I was honestly about to privy what I just saw. They tried hard to convince me this was some kind of an elite game show from hell. That this woman was being held against her wheel, like Vanna White at gunpoint, but I wasn't biting. There wasn't no way this was happening. Our first contestant is from New York. His name is Robert Howard. She read from a cue card nervously, looking up at the camera with wild eyes. She then lowered the card. I could see her hand shaking and the coolly toothly smile flash again as she lifted a hand in the air. A spotlight highlighted the area around a man sitting in a chair. He had a shotgun in his hands. I felt my nails digging deeper into the armrest. I clenched my teeth and watched in horror. He lifted the shotgun to his mouth. I saw tears running from his eyes and he fired. I could see the inside of his mouth light up for a brief second as the shot rang out, startlingly loud. I jerked in my chair from the sound of the blast. I saw his head jerk back briefly as a discharge of brain and blood hit the wall behind him. His head then launched forward. His upper body slumped against the folding in on itself, his head dangling. I could see the top of his head. I could see the blood and the gore, and I could see the smoke waiting from the blast that had penetrated. I had seen plenty of horror movies, and I had seen plenty of gore in the internet. To know the difference, I placed my hand on my mouth. I felt the air vacate my lungs as I stared at an object of terror. Judges, the woman cried out, throwing her arms as the cheap camera swung around to highlight three people sitting at a table. They wore black masks with zippers formed smiles over their mouths and white tape formed over X's over their eyes and small puncturings in them so they could see the show. One judge held up a 3.8, the other a 4.0, and the other judge held up a 3.5. Our next contestant is Carlos Rivera of Los Angeles, she said, moving to the next man. This man stood wearing no shirt and a simple pair of jeans. He was holding something in his right hand, and his head was hanging low. He looked like he was focusing, concentrating on something, trying to seal himself. He gritted butcher knife up to his neck and started slicing his throat. The knife cut coarsely through his skin, ripping through the flesh, but he didn't get across the entire float before he fell to his knees and grabbed his gullet with his hands. I saw blood spouting all over the floor, gushing outward from the open wound. His eyes were lit up with fear as he choked on his own blood. Look at him gush, the woman cried out, her voice a mixture of false enthusiasm panic and something akin to disgust. He collapsed into a pile on the floor, his legs kicking as he struggled to breathe. Judges, the woman said again, the camera swinging once more. The judges held up a 4.8, 4.9, and a 4.7 respectively. They were two other contestants, but I couldn't watch anymore. I closed the windows to the feed and walked over to my window. I had to catch my breath. My heart was racing. What had I just seen? I didn't sleep that night. I could see the man who had slit his own throat. I could see his eyes as he struggled to breathe through a throat full of his own blood. I could see his bloody hands clasping at his neck in some mixture of an instant reaction or regretful horror. I could see him kicking on the floor, laying sideways in a pool of his own blood. Every time I close my eyes now, it's all I see. Needless to say, I dropped the paper on the suicide enthusiast. My name is Benjamin and I'm an astrophysicist. 
I may have just made a profound discovery, though I doubt that I'm the only one. Surely, right now, hundreds of scientists are coming to the same conclusions. You can check for yourself if you don't believe me. Just wait until it gets dark and then head outside. Of course, unless you're a trained astronomer with your star charts handy, the odds are that you might not notice anything strange at all. My role in all this started only a few hours ago, although it feels like far longer. I was taking readings of the cosmic background radiation in my university's observatory when I noticed something odd on one of the monitors. A patch of sky was being analyzed by some software, likely initiated by one of my colleagues. I noticed a sudden drop in the signal. If I hadn't let my eyes wander over to the screen at the exact right moment, I might not have seen anything at all. The signal didn't drop out entirely, it just decreased sharply and suddenly in magnitude. Where before the digital telescope's pixels were reading ones, they were now reading zeros. To put this in layman's terms as best as I can, the stars had gone dark. But only a few of them. I looked around the building and the break room, trying to find the person who belonged to the data, but I was completely alone. At this point, it was no more than a curiosity to me. Since my own data was still compiling and since my favorite online card game was blocked by the university's firewall, I decided to head up to the roof to do some basic observations. I'm an astrophysicist, not an astronomer, so I spend far more time gazing at computer screens than at the stars themselves. But I remembered a bit of my undergraduate credits and dusted off the rooftop optical telescope. I did my best to find a patch of sky that had experienced the sudden signal loss. I believed that I had found it, but it was unremarkable and I couldn't tell if anything was amiss at all. I hate to say it, but I gave up then and there. Since I still had some time while my data compiled, I decided to be nostalgic and give the heavens a quick scan. I peered at my favorite constellations, or at least the ones that I remembered. First, I located Polaris, the star which through an accident of axial precession was in a near-perfect position to guide mankind north for hundreds of years. I checked out the Gemini twins, Castor and Pollux, brothers to Helen of Troy and inspiration to the two-man space flights in the early 60s. Then I looked to Orion, one of the first constellations that a freshman astronomer will pick out. I traced out the form of the hunter, the way I had learned long ago. Orion's left shoulder was Betelgeuse, a strangely reddish star. His other shoulder was Bellatrix. Orion's right foot was... It was missing. I remember that this was supposed to be the star Rigel, a distant high-energy supergiant. I couldn't find it anywhere. Stranger still, Orion's belt, that famous straight line of stars, didn't look quite right either. Confused, I kept looking at the stars, wishing that I had retained more of my undergrad astronomy. I looked for the brightest stars visible from my position on the globe. Everything seemed fine. Capella was there. Sirius, the dog star, was shining brightly. But then, I noticed that Canis Major, the constellation containing Sirius, was incomplete. The dog had no tail. I couldn't for the life of me remember that star, so I ran downstairs 
past the laboratory where my data was probably ready, to an unlocked classroom. I grabbed the textbook off the shelf and started skimming. After a few minutes, I found it. The missing star was a Ludra, a distant star remarkable for its stability and used as a standard candle. My triumph was short-lived, however, because I had no idea what it all meant. No Rigel, no Aludra, and a general sense of wrongness in the sky. I needed more data. I grabbed some more materials from the classroom. I intended to return them, but I'm now just realizing that I forgot. Oh well. I ran back up to the roof and started going over my observations with the proper reference materials. The two stars that I had noticed missing were Rigel and Aludra. However, other stars such as Betelgeuse, Capella and Polaris were all present and accounted for. I looked at an index of stars and finally saw a pattern. The missing stars were further away than the others. Even though they both make up as parts of Orion's body, Betelgeuse and Rigel are hundreds of light years distant. I spent the rest of the evening doing a systematic survey of the night sky. Unfortunately, there was an entire hemisphere between me and half of the visible stars, but I gave it my best shot. My initial theory was confirmed. The stars that were furthest away from Earth were missing. But I refined my observations. Using the optical telescope and my basic star charts, I came up with a long list of missing stars. I took these data points down to the lab and started building a computer model. I used a 3D map of the galaxy and plotted out the missing stars. That's when I noticed it. The data points all fell outside of a certain radius. There was a nearly perfect sphere of stars, with everything outside having simply vanished. An interstellar radius, hundreds of light years wide, was trapping all the visible stars and shutting out all others. Since that discovery, I haven't been able to stop myself from coming up with crazy explanatory theories. Were the stars all destroyed? No, they couldn't have gone Nova. We would have seen it. That colossal release of energy probably would have destroyed the Earth. Had a chunk of the galaxy simply been trapped in a giant sphere? It fit the data, but it was crazy. What could do that? Who could do it? And why? Does the sphere imply intelligence? Or is it a natural form? Maybe we weren't in the Milky Way at all anymore. Perhaps our little sphere of stars was removed, teleported out of the galaxy. But that was just as impossible as anything else. I've taken some sleeping pills to quiet my mind if nothing else. I'm sure that by the time I wake up, the entire scientific community will be abuzz with this information. But I'll leave you with a few things before I crash. The sphere, or whatever it is, outside of which all the stars have gone out, don't be narcissistic and think that it's centered on Earth. I plotted the sphere and, while Earth is inside it, we are not at the center. The perfect center as best as I can tell from my data, is an unremarkable G-class star located several hundred light-years from Earth, known to me only through a search of the stellar catalogues. I've no idea what this means. Finally, and possibly the most disturbing thought I've had all night, is this. Because of the speed at which light travels, and because of the radius of the sphere, whatever happened to make the stars go dark, it happened 
over 700 years ago. My brother died about a month ago. It was unexpected. A daytime car accident, not even alcohol involved, and he was gone. I took it poorly, but my parents fell apart. I decided to take time from work to move back to the other side of the state to help them. I quickly realized that it was a lot easier said than done, and nothing made me feel more helpless than sitting there silently while they cried night after night, day after day. I made sure that they at least ate some food and strategically moved most of the liquor bottles from the house. I handled a few small things, funeral arrangements, turning off his cable and water, other bullshit. Outside of that, I was absolutely worthless. When we were contacted to clean out his house, I jumped at the opportunity. I felt sort of shitty by how relieved I felt to have an excuse to leave my parents for a few hours a day, but I'd never been good with emotions. I handled things the good old fashioned Irish way, press everything deep, deep down, throw myself into my work, and drink myself to bed whenever the emotions wanted to rear their ugly head. It wasn't the healthiest method, but it mostly worked, and it was all I knew how to do. It hadn't really hit me that he was gone, and I may be an idiot, but I knew that there was a good chance I would break down at his place. I was ready, though. I got a nice bottle of his favorite bourbon and figured I would spend the first few hours self-medicating and reminiscing. His house was one of those old farmhouses a short drive from Toledo. It was old enough to have smaller doors and a large, wide porch. I silently cursed myself for never finding time to visit him since he'd moved here. I was busy, he was busy, and at the end of the day everybody's just an asshole with regrets. When I pulled into the driveway, I noticed he had been doing pretty good for himself. The place was really well kept up, with the exception of the out of control grass. The house itself had a fresh coat of paint and looked neat and trim in the evening sun. I walked up to the door, flipping through the keys that his landlord had given me. My brother had been working at a high school, teaching drama. I'm pretty sure I was giving him a hard time about it the last time we had talked on the phone. Jesus. The lights inside worked fine and I found two nice bourbon glasses in the kitchen cabinet, into which I poured two generous drinks. I tried to think of something to say out loud, but nothing sounded right, so I ended up eyeballing the ground guiltily while shooting the whole glass. I was a shit brother, all in all. I poured another for myself and slowly walked around the house. I was surprised by how tidy everything was. He really had come a long way from the sloppy little brother I knew. He had pictures on the wall of him happy, him with his kids on stage him building sets for shows. It was weird seeing him as an adult. He was always younger in my mind. Even his bedroom was impeccable. His clothes were folded in his drawers with military precision, and the only thing out even slightly of place was a book he had been reading on his nightstand. My glass was empty. I sighed and returned to the kitchen. I unplugged the refrigerator braced myself and began emptying the fridge into a trash bag, trying to breathe as little as possible. He still had containers of food for the remainder of the week inside, labeled with each day. I might have had a little more to drink. After I walked to the living room, looking at the pictures again, here was a happy man, a man living a life that I didn't know. It didn't seem right how little we had talked how we had never made time for each other in our lives. There were burnt DVDs and jewel cases neatly stacked by his TV. Each had a label on them. Spring Special 2014. Fiddler Fall 2015. 
Peter Pan, Winter 2014. There had to be 30 of them, and he was so proud of his work. Feeling nostalgic, a remorse, or drunk, I turned the TV on and opened the DVD player. There was already a DVD inside, Autumn 2015. I closed the player and hit play. As much as my brother loved theater, he had never been great at electronics. The camera was facing a gray brick wall, out of focus. I had chuckled slightly and took another sip. The camera jerked on its tripod and the autofocus struggled to catch up. I could make out a silhouette on a chair. The focus finally corrected. There was a small girl on the table. A man walked into the frame holding a small, three-pound sledgehammer. I could only see the torso due to the spectacularly bad tripod setup. The man stretched slightly and then began smashing the child with the hammer. He began at the extremities, working his way inward. The girl screamed silently the audio disabled, either intentionally or not. I couldn't tear my eyes away. The hits continued, sometimes spattering the gray brick wall behind it with blood and viscera. I flinched when the hammer finally hit the young girl's head. Her body spasmed and twitched for what felt like an eternity. The shreds of her arms flailed. The disc stopped. I threw up, probably ruining the impeccable carpeting. I stared at the now blank TV. I needed a drink, but at some point I had dropped my glass. It felt unreal. It was probably a side project, right? Some off-Broadway torture porn one act? Makeup artists these days had really come a long way. I wasn't convincing myself. I walked outside, grabbing the bottle on the way out. I pressed my head against the clean white column on the patio. I, I couldn't think. My ears were buzzing and nothing felt right. I couldn't think. My eyes focused on the grass. There was a problem I could fix. Muscle memory. Repetition. Work. Move your body until your brain works. The mower was in the shed. It had gas and started up fine. The back of my mind noticed the spark plugs were new. It fired right up. The guy in the video? That could have been my brother. Hell, it could have been anyone. It could have been staged. Maybe it was some viral marketing for a horror movie. I pushed the mower, sweating slightly more from the heat of the day. If I watched another DVD, I'd know for sure. It would probably just be a bunch of shitty high school kids in shitty costumes doing a shitty play. Probably. But I couldn't chance another DVD being another one like that. I don't think my brain could handle it. The grass was so long I had to push the mower back up and run over the same spot again so it wouldn't choke. My brain raced. Her twitches. The way her eye popped when the hammer struck her head. It didn't seem fake. I hadn't realized that I had mowed most of the lawn until the mower struck something. I let it die. There was a storm door on the side of the farmhouse. There was a padlock on the outside. I felt dizzy. On autopilot, my hands pulled the keys from my pocket and opened the lock. It was well oiled and opened without a problem. I pulled the storm door open, numb. There were scratches on the inside of the door. Most of a fingernail was sticking out from one of them. I slowly walked down the steps, wanting to be wrong. At the bottom was something small, covered in blankets. It didn't move. It had been a girl, but that was weeks ago, before my brother left for work and never returned. It was in a room, a neat, well-organized room. The room was freshly painted, had a modest toilet, utility sink. Dry goods were stacked on shelves across the far wall. 
There was no lack of food. My brother was good at taking care of his things. She had bitten into her arms, trying to draw moisture from her own blood. I slid to the ground, staring blankly ahead of me. I should call the cops. I had done so little to help my parents with my brother's death. I just took care of some arrangements, turning off his utilities. His water. I'm a female paralegal and have worked in the downtown area of a city in the south of about 1 million people. So I've gotten used to seeing crazy stuff happening from time to time, but this one really scared the crap out of me. I had just gotten off work and was walking the block to my car. Two co-workers of mine had walked ahead of me by a couple of yards. As I had stopped my car, one of the co-workers, Z, a male, had a large popcorn machine in his car that I was borrowing, so I opened my trunk while waiting for him to pull up and put it in the trunk for me. The other co-worker, V, also a female, was continuing on to her car when she flagged Z down to give her a ride to her car, which was parked literally one spot away. Z thought she was joking, but she made the motion for him to look up the other way where there was a scruffy guy walking towards us talking loudly to himself and carrying a huge, probably six foot long chain that was about three inches round and he was slapping on the pavement as he walked by. So V got in Z's car and rode with him the approximately 25 parking spots up to me. When they reached me, he jumped out, opened his truck and practically threw the popcorn machine in my car while talking to the guy who wanted a ride to where he said Z's friend Charles was. Z was telling him he didn't know anyone by that name and jumped in his car, slamming the door and started to take off. The crazy dude had opened Z's back door and was trying to get in Z's car as he was pulling off. Meanwhile, I'm scurrying back to my car. I jump in and immediately lock my doors. I'm watching the dude because I just wanted to get out of there. And he tried three times, all the while screaming about Charles to get in front of the passenger door. Then he goes to the front of my car where there was a big storm drain and bends down like he's looking into the drain. That's when it went downhill. He jumped up and spun around and that's when I saw how crazy he was. His eyes were practically glowing with cray cray. He reached back with the hand he was holding the chain in and went to slam the chain down on the hood of my car. But I had gotten the car in reverse and started backing out with my eyes glued on his. Since I wasn't looking back, Z had driven around and pulled back in, blocking me. But he was jumping out of the vehicle with his gun. Z and the crazy dude yelled at each other for a second. I had no idea what they were saying because even though I was still sitting between them, my eyes were still glued to his crazy eyes and my brain was in fight or flight mode. Z got back in his car and hightailed it out of there and I noped right out of there. But as I was pulling out, there were some other female co-workers walking through the parking lot, and I didn't want to leave them alone with this guy. I called security. I worked for the state at the time, and it was a state-owned parking lot, which required you to call them before the police and gave them a description of the guy. I then called 911 and did the same. The police department was one block away. My badass self thought I should yell at the guy that the police were on their way, and this was why the women would know to hurry up and get out of there as well. So, I yelled the cops were on the way. He jerked his head to look at me, yelling back that he didn't care and to fuck the police, yada yada. When his eyes started doing the glowing crazy thing again, he reached back with his chain wielding hand and just ran full speed at my car, swinging the chain as he ran. That's when I noped out of there for good. Security told me that they never saw the guy by the time they got there, but... The cops ended up catching him that night. Turns out, dude had been in the town for a music festival and his friends left without him. I can see why. Let's not ever meet again, crazy fucker.
Look, I know this is your job and everything, right? I understand that you have to ask these questions, but I've already told this whole story to the officer who rescued me. Well, the officer who untied me. Somebody else rescued me. Or something, at any rate. I have a good memory for details. Do you understand me? Like, nearly a photographic memory. Yes, I know that technically doesn't happen, but the point is, I remember everything about a scene, down to the most minute details. It's an annoying part of who I am, both for people who know me and myself. Just a side effect of my OCD. And not this nonsense self-diagnosed, I like things clean so I must have OCD stuff. I have an actual mental aberration about this sort of thing. I remember the exact amount of my first paycheck from my first job 12 years ago. $544.11. I remember the exact outfit I was wearing on my disastrous first date. A white t-shirt which was about two sizes too small, on purpose, and blue jeans with my favorite pair of brown sandals. Don't judge, it was 2005. It's not just milestones either. I remember the exact pattern of this neck tattoo that a blonde cashier had when he sold me a bag of potato chips back in 2008. It was a tribal art design that vaguely resembled a fox. The left ear was a little wonky, so I thought it was a rabbit at first until the guy corrected me. Are you getting my point? I remember everything. So when I tell you that I remember everything that happened to me, you know that I'm not exaggerating. I know a lot of people in similar situations repress a lot of stuff. But this isn't me, okay? God, I wish I could though. I remember it was three nights ago when I was driving home. I felt cold steel against the back of my head a short ways down the road. I remember the rotten breath of the creep in my back seat who gave me instructions well off the beaten path, up to this little old shanty out in the woods. I remember him keeping his gun trained on me as he got out of the car first and then dragged me out. There was a crunching of dead leaves and twigs from under my feet. I knew from how long we'd been driving there was nobody around for miles, but he still felt the need to gag me. I remember the sickening sweet smell and taste of the duct tape he used to cover my mouth, not to mention the feel of the adhesive on my wrist as he bound them tightly behind my back. He then forced me to march at gunpoint around the back of his house to his cellar, though I'm sure the creep had his own little pet name for that place of torment. Before I was forced in, however, I remember seeing something very strange. I filed this one away for later, as I was obviously occupied. Even with attentiveness like mine, you tend to get distracted when you are bound, gagged, and kidnapped by some foul-breathed pervert. But I remember seeing it. I don't know how to describe it. It was like a piece of the trees had broken off and taken a roughly human shape. Oak brown with a strange sort of shimmer to it. It was like a finely polished wooden statue of a man. There were no facial features, which is why at first I thought that's exactly what it was. Until I saw it again. The son of a bitch had put a metal collar around me and locked it to a cold steel pole, giving me just enough space to be able to sit, not lay down. He then went on a diatribe like most of these sickos do to justify his actions. He began talking about how all of us really love this kind of treatment, and before time, I would be thanking him. Even without my condition, I would have remembered those words because that's when I saw it again, peeking at us through the small cellar window. It was maybe a foot tall and three feet wide, but its face was clearly there, staring at us. I would have said something, but the duct tape was still over my mouth. I may have had some sort of expression of fear, or at least curiosity at the beast, 
but I'm sure this guy just thought it was a reaction to him. The damnedest thing though is that despite the fact that this being had no eyes, and the fact that me and the pervert were in roughly the same position in the cellar, I knew for a fact that the creature was looking at him, not at me. There was something sinister, hungry even in its contemplation. I didn't have the facial cues, but I could feel the creature's energy well enough. I, of course, had my own problems to worry about as the freak began to prepare himself for whatever sick plans he had for me. But he didn't get very far. There was a knocking on the door upstairs. The creep dropped his little bag of toys. It shook like a leaf. He put an extra layer of duct tape over my mouth and then put a cloth hood over my head. All that I can remember from this point on is the sounds of what happened. I didn't really have any other sense to go by until your officer found me two days later. What I heard, I will never forget as long as I live. I may eventually forget my first paycheck, my first date, and that damn botched tattoo. But I swear, the sounds that creature made as it pushed its way through the door will haunt me forever. Try to imagine the sound of every tree in the forest snapping in half at the same time, and you might approach what it sounded like as the beast tore this man apart bone by bone. The screaming only lasted a little bit, but when the screaming stopped, the desecration of this monster continued. I was scared, of course. I still hadn't pieced everything together yet, and here I was, bound to a pole with no way of helping myself and convinced that I would be the next thing to suffer the same fate. Just about the time I began to panic, pulling tightly against the damn collar that kept me tethered in place, I felt a soft, polished wooden hand grasp my forearm. It wasn't a firm grip, or a forceful grip. It was a soft, reassuring one. I felt the creature's face mere inches away from mine behind the hood. There was a whisper, almost like a child's voice, only a touch more raspy. Don't worry, the monster is gone now, it said. After that, the creature left me. And I don't mean that it went back upstairs or anything, I mean it disappeared on the spot. And that's it. That's everything I remember until you all showed up. I don't trust that I need to bore you with the details of the two days I spent alone in that damn cellar. I know you probably think I'm crazy already, but there is one last thing I guess I should tell you. While the creep was screaming, I heard another sound echoing through the cabin. It was the sound of dozens of people around my age, laughing in triumph and malice glee. I'm sure that when you search the place, you'll find evidence that I wasn't the first. Far from it. But I know for a fact that I was the last. The year was 1991 when I attended my high school junior prom with my girlfriend at the time. There was nothing unusual about the prom. Hundreds of teenagers in garish dressed dancing and partying, crowning their king and queen. Neither I nor my girlfriend were in the popular or cool kids crowd, and we planned on nothing more than a late night stop at a restaurant after the prom ended. As it turned out, we were invited to go along in someone's limo to visit the White Lady's Castle, the ruins of a small villa overlooking the Lake Ontario shore. Local legend held that years ago, a teenage girl ran off on a date with a local boy despite the objections of her overprotective mother. 
The girl had supposedly stormed out of the house, saying that she was going up to the lake with the boy and would be back that evening. According to the legend, she never returned and her mother is said to have gone out looking for her missing girl every night for the rest of her days. It's said that her spirits haunts the site to this day and that illicit teenage lovers parked along the shore would be attacked by her ghost. All that remains of the White Lady's castle is a single stone wall set into the hillside. Flagstone steps take you from the road below up to a flat grassy area where the structure once stood. Someone in the limo handed out flashlights as we pulled alongside the lake shore and got out. Now, although I've had a few of what I believe to be true paranormal experiences in my life, I didn't think this particular legend could really be true. It all sounded a little too stereotypical of a made up ghost story for me. We made our way to the hillside and began to climb the steps along the ruined wall. As we reached the top, the moon, which had provided a soft illumination to the lakeshore, suddenly vanished behind the clouds. We found ourselves in a pitch black clearing. Several of the kids in the group were laughing and trying to scare each other. It was dark that I couldn't see my hand in front of my face, if not for the bobbing lights from the flashlights casting shadows across everyone in the group. I began to get an eerie feeling as I scanned my flashlight around the perimeter of the clearing, the light beam ending abruptly at the trees surrounding us. I couldn't put my finger on it exactly, but it almost felt like we were being watched. I turned back to look into the darkness one last time and shine my flashlight across the tree line. And as my light moved, a face suddenly flashed into view as my light moved by. It was only for a second, but I could clearly make out a stark white face with an oversized mouth full of sharp teeth and deep hollow black eyes. Startled, I quickly shined my light back to the spot where I'd seen the face, but there was nothing there. For a moment, I decided that it must have been my imagination and turned back to leave. When I reached the top of the stairs, however, I heard a wheezing groan from the darkness behind me. I quickly turned back and pointed my flashlight into the darkness, right in the exact spot where I had seen the ghoulish white face was the outline of a person, a flowing white form was slowly moving towards me, and I could just about make out the oversized mouth and teeth I had seen before. Terrified, I turned and literally ran down the stairs and back out into the light of the moon. My girlfriend and the other kids from the group hadn't even noticed that I'd fallen behind and were beginning to load into the limo across the street. I couldn't bring myself to look back over my shoulder as I climbed in, quietly stunned by what I experienced. Of course, None of them believed my story and assumed I was just goofing around and trying to scare them. But I know what I saw, and I know what I heard. I've been back to the site once or twice over the last 25 years, but only in the daytime. I've come back here today to share my story with you and to ponder the memory of that night at the White Lady's Castle. You are sitting on your sofa. The black leather has molded to the shape of your rear, perfectly encapsulating you in a warm pool of comfort. You have been watching The Walking Dead for three hours now, in the vain hope of catching up with your friends. But it's getting late, and you're tired. You are going to head off the bed when the current episode finished, but by that time you reach a strange state where you're so tired you couldn't possibly fall asleep. Your mind just doesn't even have the energy to shut down. 
So here you sit, barely even taking in the episode you're watching, just wishing something interesting would happen. But nobody's home, and it's far too late for someone to come knocking at the door. Get up. Yes, you heard me. Get up off that sofa. Turn off the TV. That's it. Now get your coat and put on your shoes. Don't bother getting dressed out of your pyjamas. Nobody's going to see you tonight. You're clearly very bored, so you should head off on an adventure. Yes, I know it's late, but there's no better time for the adventure I have planned for you. I'll lock the door and leave the keys in the house. I know, some could come rob your house, but trust me, if you make it back from this, you're not going to want to go fumbling around with keys. Yeah, it'll be dangerous, but that's all part of the fun. Close the door and step off the patio. Now, head down the road east. What? You don't know which way is east? Haven't you ever seen where the sun rises and sets? You remember the way to the river, right? Down by the park? Yeah, you go down there to hang out with your friends along the west bank. Well, that's where you're going. Gosh, what are they teaching you kids these days? You don't even know which direction you're going. Your footsteps echo off the asphalt, like the house around you make up the walls of a dark cavern, with stalactites of streetlight dripping down from above. Without them, the darkness would be suffocating. You take shelter in the silky golden light, making sure not to let your body fall outside of it for more than a moment before moving to the next zone of illumination. The houses are all dark, as if abandoned, or perhaps those have been use of darkness to hide and observe. Amused at your futile efforts to evade the detection of the horrors that lurk where the light dare not touch. Here you are, a break in the warm glow of the roads. The park. It is an immense field of inky blackness. Not even the moon shines upon it this night. Isn't it just picturesque? Now, go on. Just cut straight across the field to the river. Past the playground. Continue down to the bank. Now that you're at the bank, you want to head north. I mean left. There it is. See? The big old sewage pipe. You've seen it before. And it's rusty great always seems easy enough to pull off. You and your friends have never been foolish enough to try it though. A smart move in your part. Well, now is your chance to see what's in there. Just pull that dirty thing off. You were right about how easy it was. It just falls right off with a little effort. Now, toss it aside and climb into the pipe. Someone else will come and replace it. Don't worry, no sewage has flown down here in a decade or two, but your footsteps might stir up a bit of stench. It's dark in the pipe. You can't even see the nose on your face, like your eyes have been covered by a thick dark veil. You can feel your way around, but it isn't pleasant. The sides of the pipe are completely rusted and crumple at your touch. Now, you'll need to listen to me and move quickly. You're not alone in there. You're looking for an opening in the ceiling. A hole torn through the floor and into the pipes. By who, you ask? Well, by the one in there with you now. He can't hear, and sight is useless in a place like this, but he can smell. In fact, he can smell just about as good as a bloodhound. He sniffs around in those pipes, searching for another lost soul to wander into them. But none have been down there in a while, and he's getting very, very hungry. Right, sorry, I should hurry you along. So, follow my directions and turn exactly when I tell you to turn. No later, no earlier. Failing to obey me will result in you smacking into a wall and cutting this whole adventure short. Now run. I know it's cramped, but run as fast as you can. Don't bother feeling around, it'll only slow you down. Keep going straight. A little to the left. You're mendearing. You can hear him now, can't you? The heavy panting, the relentless stomping of feet. The footfalls are too quick to be from someone else running through the pipes. But too heavy to be a dog, as the panting implies. It's as if they're running on all fours. But only animals do that. Right? Now left. Right. Forward a bit. Right. Left. Left. Straight ahead. 
Now jump. Without hesitating, you leap, and are surprised to find yourself ascending beyond the pipe ceiling and landing on your chest upon a hard concrete floor. You quickly scramble up, scratching your legs on the many jolting spikes of metal that brace the gap between this floor and the pipe. Once your feet have landed on solid ground, you turn around and look back down the hole in the floor. It's too dark to make out any details, but you see a pair of bright green eyes staring at you from below, before quickly darting away back into the pipe. A faint whimpering sound echoes through. Fantastic. You've made it out of there. Alive and everything. That's no small feat, you know. Now, you need to feel around for a doorway. Just drag your hands along the rough walls until they give way. There it is. Just go through there, and you'll be out in the hallway. Fill your way through until you find the staircase. Then you'll need to go up two flights. That's it. Just slowly feel your way along the walls. Oh, you seem to have kicked something. It was soft and it made a solid thump when your foot struck it. I wouldn't worry about it. Just step over it. Keep going. I think you're almost there. The wall disappears as you run your hand along it, giving way to another pitch black corridor. Suddenly, your hand touches something. You pause for a moment, slightly frightened, but assuming it's just the wall. You feel it a little more and quickly realize the gravity of your mistake. The object is soft and warm. In the moment that your hand passes over it, it seems to rise slightly, emitting a raspy breath. Before you can study the object any longer, you find your legs carrying you down the hallway at speech you never thought possible by you. Your footsteps are too heavy to hear any following you, but you run nevertheless. You run for what felt like an hour. Your heart pounding almost as fast as your feet pounded the floor. Suddenly, your chin tatters and your brain is rocked by a hard smack into the wall. You collapse on the floor and your mind becomes hazy. No, no, don't pass out now. I need you to stay with me. Okay, your chin is busted and you've probably got some serious brain damage, but it won't matter if you just keep moving. The hallway continues right and I'll be able to warn you when you reach the stairs. Go, go, go! You continue running down the corridor. You're not sure if you're even being followed anymore, but you feel it's best not to take any chances. You're not running as fast this time. Your mind is too hazy to concentrate on moving your legs properly. You stumble every few steps and your vision is fuzzing. Your chin is dripping blood. You try to feel it as you run to assess the damage, but the moment you touch it, your hand jolts back from the sharp pain it sends through your face. You decide to ignore it and keep going. Slow down now, you're almost at the stairs. In fact, you can just take a breather at the first step. You're quite the runner when you want to be. Now, you just need to go up two floors. The stairs go up half a floor at a time, so the fourth time you come across a gap in the stairs, you'll have made it. Take it slowly now, you don't want to startle her. Right, I should mention what you're going up against right now. All you need to know is that she's really easily startled. She luckily didn't spot you on the way here. Maybe she doesn't have good hearing, but what she does have is sight. If you start to run and panic, she'll panic too. And trust me, you don't want that. Just take it one step at a time. She is watching you. Breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Scratch that. The smell is terrible in here. Just breathe slowly. Focus on it and don't let her distract you. You've made it to the quarter way mark. Good job. She was waiting for you up here. She'll now be following you up the rest of the stairs. You hear her? Her shuffling footsteps on the stairs. The rustling of her clothes. Her heavy breathing on your back. She's interested in you. She hasn't seen another like you in a long time. You've made it to the first floor. Halfway there. She's starting to become a little... touchy. A little brush with your hand, peeking around your side to get a look at your face. Do not react. Any reaction is guaranteed to startle her. Let her touch you and look at you as she wants. Third quarter. You're doing really well. She's trying to get ahead of you now. She wants you to look at her. If she gets in front of you, make sure to move around. She will not like it if you bump into her. She's reaching over your shoulder now and trying to touch your chin. I know, it'll hurt, 
but let her. Your life depends on it. Her fingers pinch gently around where your chin has been mangled. A shock of pain shoots through your face. You manage to contain your recoil in a short gasp. It feels as though she moves a few shards of bone with her caress. Her finger is long. In fact, you swear you can feel a thin digit going across your shoulder and brushing past your neck. All in the same movement. As if all by one finger. She suddenly draws her finger away and you release your breath in a loud sigh, thankful that she can't hear. Here you are. Floor number two. That wasn't so bad, was it? You did superbly. Not long to go now. Just walk straight ahead. You walk, but soon enough you find yourself kicking another object. You lean down this time, determined to work out what it is you keep bumping into. Your hands feel around the object. It consists of one large part, five long protrusions and a bulb on top. It's a human, in hard, blood-caked clothing. What's more is the chest cavity seems to be, well, a cavity. There's no skin, no ribs, no flesh, not even organs. Same with the skull. The face is all there, but the top has been torn off and the brain removed. It all seems to have been cleaned out. But your hands are dry. Whatever happened to this person must have happened a long time ago. Your hands start to shake, but you take a deep breath and compose yourself. You continue down the corridor. Keep going. You're almost there. It'll all be worth it. I promise. A few more steps and you bump into another body. Feeling around it reveals that this one suffered the same fate. Don't worry. It's okay. It'll all be okay. You almost trip over another corpse, and another, and another. They seem to litter the ground like a swarm of flies after being hit by bug spray. You're almost there. Keep going. You start to realise just how quiet it is in here. And if there's not a single living soul around, just you and your footsteps upon the cold cement ground. Where are you, anyway? Don't worry about that. Come here. Come here. You slow down a little. Eventually coming to a stop as the pain in your head rises, you press your fingers on your temples and wince. Was that there before? You suppose it was, but you just never thought about it. You often get a headache from staring at screens for too long, but it doesn't usually last for such an extended period of time. And it's never this searing. But keep going. You're almost there. I can smell you. You continue, still grimacing from the pain. You come across other corpse. You tentatively step over it, but find yourself stepping inside the open chest of another dead body. You almost wrench at the sound of the flesh squishing under your shoe. But you let your foot rest inside it and step over it with your other foot, only to find yourself stepping into yet another body. You groan, trying to contain your dinner. Another step and you're finally clear of the dead. You find it odd though, how many there are in one spot. But you're here now. I can see you. Just to your right is an open doorway. Go there and search the ground for the body of the warden. You find him. Good. Now feel around his belt and unhook the flashlight. There. Now flick it on and have a look around. You push the switch on the side of the torch. The light is blinding for a few moments, but your eyes soon adjust and you look around. The corridor you came from has bodies scattered across the ground, all of their organs removed and the inside of their chest and cranium on display. There's a girl at the end of the hallway. Her fingers are long and curled up on the ground. They're tentacles, you realise. Then you remember who she is, and your heart skips a beat. But she just stands there. She has no hair, and her skin has a grey, cracked texture. She stares directly at you from her sunken eyes. They look so sad. In fact, there were small tears rolling down her face. She just stood there, arms by her side, crying quietly, with her tentacled fingers limp on the floor. Along the walls are doors and long windows. The doors were solid and metal, with a faint turquoise paint and nameplates near the top. Alicia Brown, Harry Dunlop, Simon Mattias, and many other names too far away to read. Below each one was a strip of colour with black, bold writing on them. 
They range from safe to dangerous upon green and yellow, respectively. You turn to the door you were standing beside. As you turn, you see the large amount of bodies gathered around it, all with their delicious organs scooped out. Some even piled on top of others to save space. The door is open, held there by the corpse of the warden that first made the mistake of opening my door. His body was in the same state as all the others, written on the door of his nine name, Jack Sampson. The strip at the bottom, a bright shade of red, and the word, lethal, written on there in the same bold letters. A title I wear like a badge of honour. Come inside now. Don't be shy. You step over the body and into my cell. You find it surprising how clean it is of victims. Save for the dried blood that almost coats all the surfaces in an ugly shade of dark red. I try to keep a clean home, but there are some things that you just can't get out. You know how it is. I turn. Look at me. You turn to your left to see me in the corner of the room. The first thing that sticks out to you is my massive forelimbs. They are elongated and muscular, with spikes of keratin running along the underside. These limbs are attacked to my grossly extended torso. Clothed with a specially sewn orange jumpsuit to accompany my extra limbs and body. Dangling from my body are my old, weak human arms and legs, unused for decades since my modification. I have four large, insectoid legs on the lower parts of my abdomen that I use instead of my human ones. But the most striking feature of me is my massive cranium. It is many times the size of a human. I have open orifices where my temple should be. Two fleshy mandibles flip out from my disjointed jaw. I start to move towards you, my forelegs carrying me across the room. I rise up and bear the spikes in my arms. You do not move, but stare unflinchingly at my large compound eyes. The pain in your head is at an unbearable level, like your brain is screeching in abject horror and frustration at its inability to control you. It wants to leave. It wants to leave and never come back. But I don't let it. You're mine now. You did a great job delivering yourself to me. Now stand still. I tilt my body and reach out with my forelimbs. The spike is driving into your back and your front. I lift you up to my face and begin to tear apart your chest with my mandibles. They drive into you, crushing bone and ripping it out. Finally, your succulent organs are exposed. I dig into them ravenously. You are forced to look on as your body is devoured. Your brain is screeching for help, but no others will come, for I am the only one that can hear it. The sound is satisfying. The sound of a job well done, and a prey well captured. I suck up the last of your intestines. You feel the tug in your throat before it finally tears and you are left hollow. It's still alive. I turn you over so we are face to face. Your expression is blank, but your mind is in a constant agonised scream. Blood and drill is pouring down my chin and dripping onto the floor, landing and sickening heavy drips. My mandibles are tipped up with huge, sharp, blood-soaked teeth. The openings in my temples quiver as I speak each word amplifying the pain in your head. My blue compound eyes are bulbous and go all the way up my head, getting larger at the top. The dark people stare at you with a hungry glare. I'm excited for the last course. I drag my tongue around my lips and over my numb handibles, savouring the last scrapes of your internal organs. My mouth yawns open, letting out a breath that washes the stench of death over your face. My mandibles penetrate your temples, driving straight into your brain. I let out one last piercing strike before suddenly going silent, and your body goes limp in my arms. I lap up the last delicious pull of blood from the inside of your skull. My body is wrecked with waves of pleasure from the taste. I try to suck on the flesh to get a little more of the fluid out, but it seems to have gone dry. So I lick my lips and lower the body from my face. I step by side my heavy footsteps echoing through the corridor. Towards the end of it, Alicia is on her knees and her tentacles covering her face. She is sobbing audibly, tears dropping to the floor. I toss the body onto the pile and turn to face her. I try to make her stop crying, but she just continues despite my attempts. Her brain is silent and deaf, as always.
Annoyed, I returned to my room and shut the door. Hey guys, I want to say a massive thank you to Deadly Horror, The Gothic Librarian, Immunity Zero, Brenner Lewington and Lance's Creepy Reading for taking part in Collab Week and for all the other known readers that have taken part in this Collab Week. I want to say a massive thank you to everybody involved. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends. You can also leave a comment below. All feedback, good or otherwise, is always appreciated. If you have any creepy stories of your own or have any topics that you would like me to cover, feel free to send them in via any of my social media. You can find all links to my social media in the description below. Until next time guys, make sure you lock your doors, stay safe, and I'll see you next video.